Welcome back to the Southampton International Boat Show 2022. This week we have two interviews. The first is with Coppercoat, Andy Fowling, and the second with Marlick, on board Power Generation. Now all yachtmans have a great debate over what to put on the bottom of your boat in the form of bottom paint. And uh, I've actually to say I've tried hard anti-fouling uh, for 18 months with little success and I've also put on depletive anti-fouling uh, with little success. So the other option of course is copper coat. So I'm here with Ewan at the boat show and he's going to tell us the advantages of using their copper coat. Aye. Well, the key difference between the two anti fouls you've mentioned and copper coat is the longevity. The premise behind copper coat is you paint your boat once and you won't need to lift and repaint it for typically a decade, maybe two. Okay, that sounds absolutely brilliant because you're actually going to save an awful lot of money on lifting every year. So if you're a liverboard and you're continuously cruising, that makes a big difference. And also, in a lot of places, you can't get a large catamaran out of the water. So absolutely the right. Idea. And of course, you will get some fouling eventually, no matter what anti-foul you use. With this being a hard coating, you can just, if you're overboard, you can just dive over the side, wipe it over. That sounds brilliant. Now, I have heard, and uh, you can tell us the truth behind this, yeah. is it actually more difficult to apply to the bottom of the boat than other anti -fouling? It is technically not difficult. It is just mixed in a bucket and applied with a roller. But it is quite physically demanding. You're doing normally four or five thin coats, and they are done consecutively over a few hours all in one day. So you need the right size workforce appropriate to the size of the job. Uh, what about preparing the hull ready to put this on? I mean, can I just stick it over the top of my anti fouling that happens to be on the boat? No, and that is another key difference. With copper coat being an epoxy, it needs to go on to a firm, stable substrate. So you couldn't put it on top of last year's ablative anti-foul because that will eventually come off and it would bring the copper coat with it. So you strip the boat of any existing anti-foul and apply this direct to the gel coat. So it sounds like the obvious thing to do if you get a, buying a new boat is uh, just go straight for the copper coat. Best time and lots of boat manufacturers will offer you copper coat as an optional extra when you're specifying the boat. You'd have option A, have the boat bare, B, have conventional anti foul C, have copper coat. And how much do you think it would cost for roughly, say, my 40 foot uh, monohull uh, to cover with your anti foul? 40 foot monohull will be in the region of £1,000 plus local VAT. Yeah, we'd have to think back to when we were in the Caribbean, we paid uh, something like $2,000 for anti-fouling for our boat and uh, really that only lasted us 18 months so in a lot of ways the great saving I suppose comes from not having to have it lifted and reapplying it. Oh absolutely huge time saving and someone with a catamaran often you're limited on where you can come out um, so it saves all of those logistic problems. And how long have you been making the product and any idea how many boats have been covered? We are now in year 30 so, and over that time, we're looking at about 100,000. Um, but that's of all sizes, from 15 foot dinghies up to you know, 100 meter seaports. So that's across the board. We're with Jason now, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the environmental benefits of copper coat. So, Jason, tell us exactly how environmentally friendly or not friendly is copper coat compared with other anti foul Other anti uh, Copper coat is the most environmentally responsible anti foul available anywhere in the world, being 100% water based and VOC free. There's no solvent to evaporate out or solvent to dissipate into the ocean after application and during application, so your workforce are not breathing in horrible toxic fumes. The environment is clean with only water vapour coming off during the application. The biocide we use is pure copper powder, 99.7% pure naturally occurring element found in the world's oceans. It's estimated there's 4,800 million tonnes of pure copper suspended in the world's oceans. And many, many organisms use copper as their respiratory pigment. The blood of lots of bottom dwelling organisms is green and blue because they use copper. Our blood is red because we use iron. 
So pure copper is nowhere near as damaging to the environment as some of the other toxic heavy metals that have been used in the past and are still used in some antifouls in some parts of the world. Because the anti-fouling uh, is quite restricted, isn't it, on what people are allowed to put into it? When we, yes, when we started uh, 30 years ago, there were over 50 active ingredients that you could put into your recipe to make up your antifoul. Um, that does include uh, pigments, they're not classed as active. So these are active chemicals which will deter marine organisms in, in colonising the surface. That has been reduced now to 10 or 11, depending on how you want to look at it. So there's been a massive reduction in the palette that you can go to. And legislation is now also trying to push towards only one active biocide in any antifoul. That's fabulous news for us, because in 30 years we've only ever had one active substance, pure copper. Um, all the other antifouls are still using blends, they're using cocktails of actives, uh, we have only ever used one. So for us, the faster the new legislation comes in, the better. It, from the environmentalist point of view, copper coat wins hand down. I, I can see no antifoul, even some of the low friction products, being as environmentally responsible as copper coat. The low friction products uh, are 35% solvent, so you've got solvent to deal with during the application uh, and, and during the usage it leaches into the water. They also have silicon oils in them, which is very bad for certain organisms, usually bottom living organisms, it affects their respiratory system. And with them only lasting two or three years, when they're removed, you use a product which is 65% solvent to get rid of it. So there's a massive amount of solvent which goes up into the atmosphere and contributes towards climate change and global warming. I think it's undoubtable that on our next boat we're going to go down the Copper Coat River. Um, it, 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 it's something that we've struggled with over and over again and I've been out there in the water scraping and goodness knows what. But to be honest, I've had enough of it and uh, I think it is the way to go. Thank you very much. Some of you may remember that on our Lagoon 400 uh, we had a wind generator, a Rutland wind generator. And Stuart's here and he's going to tell us a little bit more about the range from Rutland. Hi Stuart. Hello. So you've got uh, about three different uh, wind generators in your range. What's the actual difference between them? Uh, so the difference is generally the output of the, of the wind turbine. So our range starts with a, a very small trickle charger which is the Rutland 504 which is really made for uh, customers who perhaps use their boat at weekends, just want something to trickle charge their batteries when they're not using the, the boat, uh, so that they've got power when they jump on board. And then you move up to the Rutland 914, which is the next size up. That always used to be our most popular wind turbine. That's designed for a boat 30 foot upwards, a couple of battery banks, one for engine start and one for domestics. Uh, and now we've got the Rutland 1200, which has now become our most popular turbine, which is the one you guys had. Yeah, it was so quiet, that's why we chose it. And yeah. Are they all as quiet as the 1200? Yeah, they are. I mean, the, the Rutlands are, are, are well known for being quiet. And when we developed the Rutland 1200, the noise from the machine was our, our biggest concern. We, it's very easy to make a wind turbine that produces a lot of output, but we didn't want to destroy our reputation on making something that sounds like a motorbike that's chasing you along. So um, yeah, they are all very quiet and, uh, and, um, and they just work away quite happily without hardly any noise at all. And I was quite impressed, uh, the blades are actually quite complicated. They're not just sort of a bit of bent plastic. They've, they've got all sorts of little notches and twists yep. to them. Yeah, so the, the blade design on the Rutland 1200, it's quite a thick base um, and quite a, a thin uh, outer section. That's so that it actually catches the low wind speeds because most of the time, especially in marina environments, you're gonna be in quite low wind speeds. So you want a turbine that's gonna produce all the time um, and so the the turbine itself starts uh, charging at a low wind speed and we have things like boundary layer trips which are the little notches you see on the on the uh, blade that actually make the uh, the, the blades uh, quieter as well so how much power do you think i'm going to get from my uh, 1200 uh, generator i know it will vary on wind strength mm. and particularly i know we found in the caribbean in the trade winds stuck in an anchorage for a few weeks it was incredibly efficient yeah we do say that in normal uh, sailing conditions, so not, not trade winds, just normal everyday sailing conditions, Rutland 1200 would produce 50 to 70 amper hours a day into your battery bank. Obviously the higher the wind speed you'll get a lot more than that, perhaps over 100 amper hours a day. Um, but like I say, all of our turbines are designed to start charging even at low wind speeds. So even at five, six knots, you're actually getting you know a few 
tw 10, 20, 30 watts going into your battery, and that's continuous, so uh, you don't need a lot of wind to get them going. And I think I'm right in saying everyone comes with uh, a, a unit to, uh, uh, I don't know sure what you want to call it, but control. A, a control unit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the Rutland 1200 actually produces three phases of AC, so we supply it with the controller. So the output from the 1200 goes to the controller and then it's rectified to DC for your battery charging. And in that controller, you've also got an input for up to 20 amps of solar, so you can have a combined uh, wind and solar system, and an output to two separate battery banks, so you can charge two banks of batteries at the same time. It's good that you mentioned solar there because I think you've got a new range of uh, walk-on solar panels. We have, yeah, we have. We've got a new range for this season. Uh, we took delivery of them only a week or so ago. Uh, they are a, um, a semi-flexible solar panel which uses the uh, sun power high-efficiency cells. Um, we've got from a 30 watt up to 200 watts, so we've got lots of different sizes. They're black, black cells and black back sheets. Uh, and the 50 watt, the 100, the 150 watt and 200 have a DuPont anti-slip surface on them. So you can walk on them with deck shoes, they're re very well engineered, well built and we've got a nice broad range of them. How do you actually hold them down? Can you glue them down or do you have yeah. to screw them down? You can either or. Uh, so they come with um, pre-drilled holes in the corners so you can uh, screw them down or you can use a Sikaflex or some sort of uh, adhesive to, uh, to, to actually stick them down. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I mean, our wind generator made a huge difference to us. I mean, we just noticed on sort of day one, really, that uh, it really did help to top our batteries up, which is something that we were lacking from our solar. So I'm a great supporter and think it's a fantastic product. Thank you. Thank you.